All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. Uh, MC Owens, as usual, uh, San Francisco Dharma Collective, as usual. Um, and tonight, so tonight, I, I'm very excited about tonight, frankly. Um, we, we have a lot to talk about. We have a lot of interesting ideas to pop up. So what I'm excited about tonight, let me start with this. So, you know, I call this Sunday night uh, Dharma study group, I call it the Dharma doors. And that is an expression, that's a, a saying within the world of Buddhism. In Sanskrit, it would be called a Dharma Pariyaya, uh, a Dharma gateway or a Dharma door. And in normally a Dharma Pariyaya, a Dharma door, is a teaching, teaching of the Buddha. That's like a general translation of it. And in general, the sutras, like the Buddhist sutras, are considered Dharma doors, gateways to the Dharma. However, there is sort of a, I wouldn't call it a technical use of the term Dharma Paryaya, but there's a particular use of this term. And what I want to re remind you all of, you might know about this, but in a sutra called the Vimalakirti Sutra, very, very popular Mahayana Buddhist sutra, I've, refer I've referenced this sutra a lot. And if you're familiar with this sutra, or you've seen you know, classes that I've done on this sutra in the past, you'll know that chapter nine of the Vimalakirti Sutra is called, well, it's normally translated as entering the gateway of non-duality. And what that is a translation of is the Advaita Dharma Paryaya the dharma door of non-duality and this is a really it's a really interesting chapter of the vimalakirti sutra it's about i'd say about three quarters of the way through the sutra and it's of course starring manjushri bodhisattva and what happens in this chapter the reason why chapter nine the, the non-duality chapter. The reason why it's sort of so interesting is it's presented in this interesting format where there's a group of bodhisattvas and they get asked, how did you all uh, discover or enter the gateway of non-duality? And then, a series of bodhisattvas in the Vimalakirti Sutra, it's about 32 bodhisattvas. They go one by one and they give a kind of a one line or two line verse summary, if you will. But they, they just recite one line that sort of encapsulates their understanding of this really interesting idea of non-duality. And this is a, it's a really interesting chapter for a lot of different reasons. But the thing about it is, is that it, it is called a Dharma Paryaya, Dharma door, and it's this particular format with these kind of bodhisattvas and, well, I won't, I won't get into this chapter too much. If you know about it, awesome. But what's really interesting is, is that tonight, we here, Sunday nights, Dharma doors, we've been reading a, a different sutra called the, uh, the Manjushri's Pure Land Sutra, Manjushri's Prediction of Enlightenment Sutra. It has a few different names, but we've been reading this now for a while. And I said something last week about this sutra. I was kind of re, um, I was going over the format of this sutra and I was mentioning that, you know, the sutra starts 
in one place up on the vulture's peak. But then the Buddha goes down into the city of Rajgriha and he gives a teaching to a householder bodhisattva, then goes back to the vulture's peak and invites a bunch of bodhisattvas from other worldly realms, invites them to the vulture's peak. And then the Buddha gives a teaching to Shariputra. And that teaching to Shariputra is about the Bodhisattva path. And in particular, it's about this idea of Bodhisattvas adorning their Buddha lands. And how, how do Bodhisattvas adorn their Buddha lands? Well, Shariputra, and that was that's sort of the teaching of that chapter. Um, or that section of the sutra. And last week, I said, my feeling right now is that the, the, the teaching to Shariputra, that that's sort of like the, the main message of this sutra. <laughs> I retract that statement. <laughs> so up until that point in the sutra, yes, that's the most important teaching. But then getting ready for tonight and kind of um, catching up to where we are in the sutra, something else has happened since Shariputra received his lesson about adorning Buddha lands. What happened was, is that we started to hear about Manjushri becoming a Buddha and that when Manjushri becomes a Buddha, Manjushri will be called Samanta Darshan uh, Buddha. And we started hearing about Manjushri's future Buddha land. And then one a Bodhisattva asks, like, wow, like, you know, Manjushri's future Buddha land sounds pretty special. Are there any other Buddha lands as special as Manjushri's? And the Buddha says, oh, yeah, actually, right now, there's a Buddha in some other zone, in a, some other direction, who has a Buddha land that is equally as adorned as Manjushri's. And there are four bodhisattvas who are practicing the exact same practices as Manjushri, and in the future, they're going to attain Buddhahood and achieve Buddha lands just as adorned as Manjushri's. And then everybody gets really excited and they're like, well, who are these four bodhisattvas? And what does this Buddha land of this other Buddha look like? And that's when last week we witnessed a miracle. And what happened was is that the Buddha revealed this other Buddha land that's equally as adorned as Manjushri's Buddha land. And everybody could see this whole other Buddha land. And then those four bodhisattvas that we were told about who are practicing the same practices as, Bodhisatt as Bodhisattva Manjushri, they showed up. They showed up to the vulture's peak, like to where the sutra is taking place. And I didn't mention this last week because I was kind of, um, we were just moving through the, the whole miracle last week. But these four bodhisattvas, they actually show up in these, uh, they're described as lapis lazuli pavilions radiating light. Four, so they, these four luminous lapis lazuli pavilions show up with these bodhisattvas inside. And then, and this is where we're at in the sutra, by the way, and then the Buddha makes it all disappear. Because it was you know, originally a miracle that he was sort of manifesting to begin with. And so then he makes it all disappear. And, and that's where we're at in the sutra. 
Oh, by the way, speaking of the sutra, so Tanya just put in the chat. I don't know why I didn't share this with you sooner. You know, I've been working on my own translation of this sutra. So in the chat is a link to the website with my translation. I'm going to be probably reading from that one tonight. So just to let you know. Okay, so I'm going to do this a little out of order. So after the Buddha makes this miracle disappear, Manjushri is, has some remarks. And I want to read Manjushri's remarks. They're very important. But then after that, Manjushri says to all the bodhisattvas gathered on Mount uh, Gridrakuta on the Vulture's Peak, Manjushri is going to ask all the bodhisattvas, so how, how do you all, how do all of you bodhisattvas explain the Eka Lakshana Dharma Paryaya? How do all of you bodhisattvas explain the Dharma door, the Dharma gateway of the single characteristic? And that was the theme for tonight, this idea of the Eka Lakshana, the one characteristic, the single Lakshana, the single characteristic. So Manjushri turns to the Bodhisattvas and say, how do you all explain the Dharma door of the single characteristic? And then in turn, each of the Bodhisattvas gives a line gives a single line or two sentences that describes their understanding of this teaching, this teaching of the single characteristic. And I guess the, you know, why I'm so excited this evening is that I feel like we've made a Dharma discovery. And what I mean is, is that up until I read this sutra, I was under the impression that chapter nine of the Vimalakirti Sutra was the, the only place that this Dharma door format could be found. So when we were, as we've been moving through this sutra, I got really excited because I started to think, wait a minute, this, this sounds a lot like the Vimalakirti section. Now it's, it's a different teaching, but what I mean is, is that the structure is the same. This kind of interesting structure, by the way, we're about three quarters of the way through our sutra, the Manjushri Sutra. So at a similar point in the sutra, Manjushri, who is in both of these sutras, appeals to this group of bodhisattvas and asks them about their understanding. And then they give this sort of, um, it's kind of a daisy chain of Dharma teachings. And so I was just really struck by the, the similarities between these two. So for all the Dharma nerds, for all the Dharma heads in the audience, this is just a very interesting kind of uh, discovery in that way. And the reason why I've given you uh, my translation or uh, the website with my translation is because as you may know, the sutra that we're reading is also found in this book, A Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, right? So the sutra we're reading is in here, but as you may know, there are parts of it that are missing. We don't know why. I talk about this a lot, but for some reason, the translators and editors of this book randomly, totally randomly, just don't translate parts of the sutra for, again, for reasons unknown. And what's really, really surprising is that now that I've really kind of read this whole sutra many times all the way through, I'm pretty sure that this is, if it's not the most important teaching in the sutra, it's one of the most important teachings. And so it's really funny that they they just pull it out. They're just like, you don't, you don't want to know about the single characteristic Dharma door. Why would you want to know about that? So you're not going to find it in here. 
You will find it, though, of course, in the translation from Tibetan, which I sometimes read as well. They do translate the entire sutra. And so this does include uh, the section I'm going to read. Unfortunately, the, from the Tibetan, they translate it as the Dharma door of the single principle. And a principle, a principle is going to be something a little different. Um, so that's why I'm not really going to use the Tibetan and I want to rely on sort of the Chinese version. So before we do that, before we get into this particular new Dharma door, we need to go back to Manjushri's uh, first remarks after the Buddha makes the miracle disappear. So this is going to be in my translation. If you're looking at that one, it's way down at the bottom, part six, the single characteristic Dharma door. Remember to, you know, the, this miracle has just taken place in which everybody saw this other world, but now the Buddha has made it disappear in that way. And seemingly as a, as a response to the disappearance of this other world, Manjushri addresses the Buddha and says, world honored one, each and every Dharma is completely, totally illusory. How so? Just as an illusionist makes illusions appear, the arising and the ceasing of all phenomena, of all dharmas, is also like this. Their arising and their ceasing, then, is without arising and ceasing. And since there is no arising and ceasing, there is equanimity. Bodhisattvas cultivating this equanimity are then able to realize attainment of unsurpassable bodhi, awakening or enlightenment. So a bodhisattva that we've never heard of before, who appears for the first time, a bodhisattva named Superior Wisdom, is going to pipe up and say, hey, Manjushri, how does one realize attainment of this awakening that you're talking about? We'll, we'll get into the answer there, but I want to kind of go back. This, what Manjushri says, each and every dharma is completely, totally illusory. So this is, uh, this is an essential teaching of Mahayana Buddhism. It kind of is, it's up there. It's basically the same idea as the teaching of what is called emptiness. Basically the same idea. But this is sort of a really fundamental, really important idea within the world of, of Buddhism in general, Mahayana Buddhism specifically. And it's the idea that all phenomena, all dharmas, anything, a dharma in this sutra and what we're talking about here tonight, a dharma is just a thing, a thing, anything. And that thing, a phenomena, it could be a, a big thing, a little thing. It could be a, a feeling, an emotion. It could be a direction, a color, like it doesn't matter what it is. If it's got a name, if, it, if it's got a description, if it's something that you could conceive of, that's a dharma. And the teaching here that Manjushri is referencing is the illusory nature of all dharmas. And again, he's sort of responding to the miraculous disappearance of this world. And is saying, oh, you know, yeah, that world disappeared, but all phenomena, all dharmas are illusory. And specifically, Manjushri references that the arising and the ceasing of all phenomena, of all dharmas, is illusory. And this is, this is an, a very, very essential teaching uh, 
which is the non-arising, also sometimes called the birthlessness of all phenomena. We've talked about it a lot. It's been a big part of this sutra so far, this illusory nature of phenomena. I think at this point, actually, I'll say, I'm, I'm going to talk more about the illusory nature of phenomena, I promise. But let's just let Manjushri's remarks saying all phenomena are illusory. The arising and ceasing of all phenomena is illusory. Even the arising and ceasing, like even the ideas of arising and ceasing are illusory. So then this Bodhisattva is like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> That's quite a, a realization. How would one attain such a realization? And Manjushri says, this bodhi, this awakening, is not some thing that can be attained. And it's also not something that can be destroyed, nor can it be abided in or grasped. This is sort of echoing things that we've heard earlier on about the very nature of awakening, about the very nature of enlightenment, that it's not a thing. It's not something that is attained in any way. And because it's not a thing, it's not graspable. It's not something you could buy or sell or hold in that way. And so superior wisdom, Bodhisattva says, then this awakening is neither existent, nor is it not non-existent. How so? Due to the nature of dharma, due to that phenomena's dharmic nature, there's originally no arising of it, nor a not yet of it, nor a was of it, and neither is it able to be destroyed for this reason, it is unattainable. So that's when Manjushri says, or asks of the Bodhisattva superior wisdom and the others, well, what, what do you call explaining the single characteristic Dharma door? So before we get into the beautiful poem here, or this kind of beautiful cascading of Dharma wisdom, I do want to talk a little bit about this idea of the single characteristic. So they have referenced this actually already a couple times in the sutra, but they mentioned it a few times without really going into the great detail about it. And so for, you know, I see that it's kind of a usual crew here, but might be a few new people, or we just haven't thought about this for a while. So I want to remind everybody about Lakshana. Like, I want to talk quickly about what, what are they talking about here? So this idea of a Lakshana. So what they're talking about, if you don't know, a Lakshana is a characteristic. You could also translate it as a quality, but let me show you. Let's work with, let's work with the, I'm gonna work with these two. So the idea here is, is that right now, if you're looking at the screen, you probably have a fairly good sense of what this is and what this is. And the point about characteristics, so what is a characteristic or a quality? Well, something like shape. The shape of something is a characteristic or a quality. And so because these are shaped differently, you don't think that they're the same thing. You think this is something and this is something. And the reason why you wouldn't mistake these as the same thing is because they have different characteristics or different qualities. This one's very thin, right? This one is hollow or you know concave in that sense. They both are black, 
in that sense. So the color is a characteristic. The size is a characteristic. Again, the shape is a characteristic. But we could go deeper too. You might have the association of music. Music, anyone with this one? So that's a characteristic of this one that it, it's, it's musical, right? Or it has something to do with music. Whereas this one has something to do with liquids and drinking, right? So those are characteristics or qualities as well. You could call that the, the use, right? The use of it is a characteristic or a quality. And the point is, is that I wouldn't put this on my record player and I wouldn't put my coffee on this. So that's sort of about the characteristics, differentiating objects, and then being like, oh, that's a record. How do you know it's a record? It has the characteristics and the qualities of a, rec of a record, of course. So characteristics, these things that are called lakshana, they are what we use to determine what it is we are perceiving in that way. That's the relationship. Actually, there is an intimate relationship in Buddhist psychology between perception, samnya, like perceiving what something is, and lakshana. Well, lakshana are that by which samnya, perception, perceives. Behold, if you're perce perceiving a cup and perceiving a record, you're perceiving those characteristics and the qualities. Okay, so those are the characteristics that they're talking about. Now, let's go, some, go somewhere very interesting. So I, of course, often talk about now these two, and we've used these a lot in the past, but this is where I wanna to start to show you the tricky nature of characteristics. So most of you have seen this before, but the question is, which is the big cup, which is the little cup? And the idea here is, is that you might be inclined to say that this is a little cup. And of course the size, we already discussed it, size is a characteristic. So a characteristic of this is that it's little. A characteristic of this is that it's cup. A characteristic of this is that it's beige, or I would say light, light colored in that way. And you know we could keep going about the characteristics. But I wanna focus on just one characteristic right now. And it's the idea that this is a little cup. And then, of course, the idea is, is that this is the big cup, little cup, big cup. But then we got this cup. And all of a sudden, this one isn't so big anymore. In fact, this is the little cup now. But I thought this was the big cup. And of course, I know that you know this. In fact, everybody kind of knows this, but we forget this all the time. And what it is, is, is that the size of these things is relative. The size, meaning the idea that this is a little cup, the size is not inherent to this. Size is in the in the eye of the beholder, in the conditioned mind of the beholder. So the conditioned mind of the beholder compares these two and says, oh, well, relative to this one, this is little. But as I often like to point out, even if I didn't show you the other cups, if I asked you, you'd probably say that this is a little cup. And that's because somewhere in your mind, you have what a normal cup is shape is size, the, the normal size, you know, a normal sized cup. And your 
comparing this, or I should be more accurate, should be careful with my language. If, if you're perceiving this as little, you're comparing it to that standard size cup and saying, yeah, this is not as big as the standard size cup. Therefore, this is little. But what I'm pointing at right now is that the size is not here. Size is in between kind of, because it's relative and dependent. So what I'm doing right now is, is I'm taking away from this, the characteristic of being big or little and actually pointing at it not having any inherent size. The size is always going to, be, going to be relative in that sense. Now, we also could talk about how this is the dark colored cup and this is the light colored cup, right? Okay, so light colored, dark colored, right? All right. So this is the light one. This is the light colored cup, right? Oh, it's almost as if color is relative and not inherent either. So now what I've done is, is I've pointed at how the size of this, which is a characteristic or a quality by which I would determine what it is, that characteristic quality is not inherent to this. The color, not inherent to this. And then we could even start talking about the mind that perceives this as a cup. And isn't that also a relative concept, relative to liquids, relative to lips, relative actually to a bunch of other stuff. And so what I'm getting at is, is that if you can really, really understand how characteristics are not actually owned or housed or possessed by the things that we think they are, if we really understand that characteristics are essentially superimposed or projected in that sense, if you're with me on all of that and you can really begin to understand how the, this phenomena is actually characteristic -less. It actually doesn't have any characteristics. If you can understand that, then you can also understand how this phenomena also doesn't have any characteristics. So this is characteristic -less as well. And in fact, this is characteristic list as well. And indeed, all phenomena, all dharmas are characteristic lists. And so what they say in the Buddhist tradition, in, the, in this tradition that we're talking about, is that all dharmas, all phenomena have the same characteristic, which is not having characteristics. And that characteristic of not having characteristics is the single characteristic, the eka lakshana. And that eka lakshana is, as I think, um, I think it was Manjushri or Superior Wisdom Bodhisattva. Well, as one of them pointed out, this nature of all phenomena of being characteristicless means all dharmas are equal. So this teaching of the single characteristic is about equanimity, equality, the sameness. And then all of a sudden, any phenomena is now understood as being this conditionally dependently originated phenomena with no characteristics of its own. And that is a characteristic, again, of everything. Yeah, Tanya, sorry. No, no worries. Um, so 
that reminds me of, and I think I've talked to you about this before, that concept of like one taste or single flavor. They also call this the, the single taste of all dharmas or the single flavor. <laughs> yep. It's that idea they use flavor to describe like a characteristic, like the way things taste, but it's a blanket term for like the way they look, the way they smell, the way they sound. And the idea that all phenomena taste the same is this teaching that they all are characteristicless in that way. Okay, everybody okay with that idea of the one characteristic of characteristiclessness? <laughs> yeah, Tani? I was just gonna say, it's yep. kind of interesting that that one characteristic, there's nothing to compare it to. It's just- That, that they do say it is incomparable. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so now we have a sense of that. Now I have sort of just made my attempt at explaining the single characteristic Dharma door. So that was my attempt. Now the first, let's see. So after Manjushri asks, hey, why don't you all explain the single characteristic Dharma door? First up, is Maitreya. So we've already heard from Maitreya. He popped up last week out of nowhere. Maitreya, of course, is like the future Buddha. So that's always interesting when Maitreya talks. So here's Maitreya's Dharma door for this idea of the single characteristic. He says, Maitreya says, if there is no seeing a location of the five aggregates or of the aggregates and also no not seeing without any differentiating and also not seeing accumulation or dispersal, this is called explaining the single characteristic Dharma door. Okay. Let's see. I was going to read the other one, but I remembered that this is a little different order. So let's just begin to break this down. So this is a pretty, uh, this is a heavy Dharma door right here. So first part of the first sentence, if there is no seeing a location of the five aggregates, So Dharma students out there will know the aggregates, of course, are form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, the aggregates of a sentient creature. Of course, the early Buddhist tradition was about dispelling this idea of the singular entity called a self, and rather kind of understanding the sentient subject as a coalescence of these five aggregates. So that's cool. You know, that's pretty standard Buddhism. But if there's no seeing a location of the aggregates. So let's just take, so of the five aggregates, the most difficult to understand regarding Maitreya statement is going to be form, the, bot, the physical body uh, of matter in that sense. So let's hold off on that right now and go to just the second one. So the second aggregate, of course, is Vedana, sensations. But in particular, we know that a Vedana is a sensory reaction, meaning that you either like a sensation or you are, are averse to a sensation, or a sensation can just be neutral, like a blink where you don't, it's unpleasant or unpleasant, it's just something that's happening. So Vedana, sensory reactions can be pleasant, not pleasant or neutral. Where, where is that happening? Where is 
the the pleasingness of a sensation where is that located exactly right let's say you were to stub your toe and that that sensation of a physical event your sensory reaction was one of that you didn't like it it was a not Ple not a pleasant thing. And so it was like, ah, it hurt, you know, it wasn't pleasant. Where exactly is that not being pleased? Is it in the toe? Is it in the brain that is processing the information and having the mental anguish? Is it in the whole being? Is it in my pinky? Like where exactly is the sensation? Where exactly is the perception? Where exactly is samskara, our conditioning? And then of course, the fifth skandha, consciousness. Where exactly is consciousness? Now, those are the four. I mentioned that the first one's a little tricky because you would wanna say like, well, the, the physical body is, is here. <laughs> in that way that's where the form is right well you know that's kind of a tricky one there in terms of the location of form and what i mean is is for example i often like to use this one and the idea here is, is that there's, there's, a, there's the form of something here. There's the shape. There's the shape of something here. What I wanna ask you is, is that if, I, if, if we talk about this as the shape, the form of a rabbit, but then some of you out there are seeing the form or the shape of a duck. So the question is, is well, where where is the form of rabbit is it here or is it in the mind of the perceiver who is seeing that duck or rabbit so my point is is that the form or the shape of something also seemingly is not as simply located in like here in that way so Maitreya tells us that if there is no seeing a location of the aggregates. So that's the first place that you kind of want to put your mind this evening is sort of not seeing the aggregates located in any particular place. So if there's no seeing a location of the aggregates, and also no not seeing. <laughs> so we, we're not going to see a location of the aggregates, and there's also going to be no not seeing of the location of the aggregates. Yeah, that's where we're at this evening, is in this like, whoa, what does that even mean, right? So, but this is how you would get to that gateway of the single characteristic. How? How would you explain the single characteristic? Well, if there's no seeing a location of the aggregates and also no not seeing, so being without any differentiating. And then the next part is interesting. It's, he says, and also not seeing accumulation or dispersal. So if you could do manage all that, that's called the single characteristic Dharma door. Now, my understanding of that last part, the idea of and also not seeing accumulation or dispersal. The way that I understand that is so. Let's say you're just you're just regular. <laughs> you're, you're just regular day, regular mind, regular. 
And then you were to hear about the single characteristic Darmendor and you were to hear this from Maitreya and he's telling us, oh, if there's no seeing a location of the aggregates, right? That's the, yeah, that's it. And so if you were like, oh, okay, Maitreya, gotcha. A moment ago, I was seeing a location of the aggregates, but now I'm going to not see a location of the aggregates. And I'm even going to go that next step and I'm not going to see not seeing the aggregates. So I'm, I'm not over where I was before where I was seeing a location. I'm over here not seeing a location and I'm not even not seeing the location, right? So I'm without any differentiating. The next part where it says, and also not seeing any accumulation or dispersal, my understanding of that is it's also then about not seeing a movement from a state of not knowing to a, or a state of not seeing or a state of seeing a location of the aggregates to a state of not seeing that idea of moving from one to the other. So like accumulation is over here, grasping, accumulating in that way. And over here is would be dispersal. I mean, in that sense of not clinging, not grasping, no location, not even seeing. So if you, if you kind of can vibe with what I'm getting at as far as there's a transition then, a transition from thinking there's a location of the aggregates to not. And then we've even done away with the idea that there's a transition from one to the other. So that is truly not differentiating. If you're at that point of not differentiating, boom, Maitreya says that's the, the single characteristic Dharma door. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about the first of these. All make sense? Somewhat? These are kind of koan-esque. They are gonna be kind of mind benders in that way. So this will be a fun one then, the uh, next. I have, uh, one thing I was sort of thinking about is it reminds me of like one of the first things you do to really learn how to draw things as they actually, well, closer to how they actually appear is to take a picture and turn it upside down and draw that because then you don't associate those characteristics like I'm drawing a chin now or I'm drawing um, and you you just put in actually light and shadow mm -hmm. and and you you that's how you sort of learn to switch into a different gear of just not not associating form and space to as far as depth perception. Yep that's Along, very much along these lines, Renata, totally. Um, we're sort of very much trying to think in that, a different way in that sense. Absolutely. That's a good analogy. Okay, so let's hear from, actually, so the next up is the kind of the other major bodhisattva of the poem, Lion Courage Thunderous Voice. So that this has been the kind of the young learner bodhisattva who's been asking Manjushri all the questions, the whole sutra. So this is Lion Courage Thunderous Voices Bodhisattva. This is their uh, statement. If there is no making any kind of differentiation, then it, meaning the single characteristic Dharma door, so then it is ordinary Dharma. It is the Dharma of the two vehicles. It doesn't go against the nature of the Dharma and enters the single characteristic, which is being without any characteristics. This is called explaining the single characteristic Dharma door. Yeah, I'm not even gonna read the Tibetan one. It says the same thing, it just says it in a more convoluted way, and it's already convoluted as it is. So 
what Lion Courage Thunder's voice seems to be saying, which is a really, really interesting statement, he's basically saying, huh, okay, well, then if there's if we're if we're not making any differentiations here, then it and you know we're kind of pointing at this idea of the single characteristic or the single characteristic dharma door. So Lion Courage is like, well, if we're not making any kind of differentiations, then it is just regular dharma. Because to try or not to try, but to differentiate the single characteristic Dharma door from like regular, regular teachings, like regular stuff. If you differentiate them, then that ain't it. Ergo, regular old Dharma is the single characteristic Dharma door. It is the Dharma of the two vehicles. Now that 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 language, if you're not familiar with it, you know, the, the sutra has been talking a lot about the path of the Shravaka and the path of the solitary Buddha, the, the Pratekya Buddha. So those are the two vehicles, the, the old school monastic path and the, the forest dwelling enlightened hermit path. Those were sort of your two paths. This sutra, of course, which is about the Bodhisattva path, it's been saying the whole time, yeah, you don't want to be a monastic follower. You don't want to just be a follower. And you also don't want to be one of those forest dwelling hermits. You want to be compassionate in action in the world. But according to the wisdom of Lion Courage here, well, then the single characteristic Dharma door is the Dharma of the two vehicles. Because once again, if we make a differentiation between the Dharma of the two vehicles and this exalted single characteristic Dharma, if we differentiate them, then we're nowhere near the single characteristic Dharma. So Lion Courage understands his non-duality in that sense. And that's where this beautiful statement, it, the single characteristic Dharma door, it doesn't go against the nature of the Dharma. And the reason why I, under, the, I understand that is saying that if, if I told you that the Dharma, like with a capital D, the single characteristic Dharma, if I told you that that was regular Dharma or that it was like Christianity, or it was Islam, or it was some other thing, if I told you that, that would seemingly go against the Dharma. Because you're talking about Islam, you're talking about some other traditions. I thought we were over here talking about the Dharma. But what's interesting is, is the Lion Courage is saying, well, if, if we're really talking about the single characteristic Dharma door, then it's regular Dharma. It's the Dharma of the two vehicles. And that doesn't go against the Dharma to say that. And thus enters the single characteristic, which is being without any characteristics. This is called explaining the single characteristic Dharma door. Now, unless there's any comments about that, ideas, questions, I will read you the Tibetan one now so you can hear how it sounds. You're, you're going to hear all the same ideas. It's just a little more, for me, not as clear. So from our Tibetan translation, that same one reads, uh, Bodhisattva Lion Courage said, the Dharma teaching on the single principle does not contradict suchness or contravene reality, but reality is the way they translate dharma, so that's tricky. It makes no divisions in terms of the dharma of ordinary beings, the dharma of voice hearers, the dharma of solitary Buddhas, or even the dharma of Buddhas. In the manner of disengagement, it engages with the single principle. So there is a, a few little things in there. In the Chinese, it doesn't talk about um, 
No, it, it does. It only talks about not going against the dharma of the voice hearers and protect your Buddhas in that way. But more or less reads the same. Yeah. Right. Cool. So let's do number three. So this is a bodhisattva called Priyadarshana, Priyadarshana, a joy, a joy to see, joyful sight bodhisattva. And so Priyadarshana bodhisattva said, if there is cultivating the practice of true suchness, yet also without creating the perception of true suchness, and within that profundity, there is nothing being differentiated. This is called explaining the single characteristic Dharma door. Okay, so first we need to talk about what it would mean to cultivate the practice of true suchness. So we have also in this sutra already come across the idea of true suchness. Tathata, it's called, or Buddha Tathata, it would be called. So this is definitely one of the trickier ideas to explain. It's this idea of, I mean, if I wanted to give you like a, a really quick understanding of it, it would be about, say, my cup. And it would be about understanding. So it would, it would be about understanding what I told you regarding characteristiclessness, which is that this is not black, nor is it small or big, nor is it a cup. In fact, it doesn't have any characteristics in that sense. Now, if you get that, that this, quote unquote this, and by the way, I haven't mentioned that and I, I have a moment, so I will mention it. So we've been talking this evening about the characteristic of characteristiclessness. So we've been focusing on this idea of the qualities, you know, that it is black, a cup, that it, that it is uh, something that fits into my hand, that it is, made of ceramic. So if you understand what we've been talking about, about characteristic listness, that those are all relative and dependent in the mind. If you understand that about all the characteristics, right? Then that raises a very interesting philosophical question. What are we calling black? What are we calling uh, big or small? What are we calling, you know, ceramic? Like, what is the it, the, the singular entity that is black, that is a cup, that fits in my hand? Well, the idea is, is that that is the most, that's the trickiest part about this. It's the presumption that there is one thing in my hand. Is there only one thing in my hand? They like think about that really carefully. Is there only one thing in my hand? The last time I checked, the only one thing in my hand is that cup. But we've already talked about how a cup is an idea or a concept that's related to a bunch of other ideas. And so the cupness is not inherent. So what we realize is that the, the label cup is the label for the singular entity. And if you realize, oh, there's not a singular entity in my hand, then that's the teaching of emptiness that there's actually just not even a singular entity underneath all of those characteristics. So there's an important relationship between emptiness and characteristics, 
which is that characteristics are superimposed upon nothing. That's the kind of the big reveal of this teaching of emptiness, which is that the very reified singular entity that's even this one, where's my other one? Another one. You know, it's just, a, it's just one thing, right? Is it just one thing? Or is the only one thing the record? And again, we've already dealt with the record as a relative concept, a relative idea. So I wanted to point out really quickly about how this relates to that teaching of emptiness, right? So now, if you understand that the cup is empty, meaning that there isn't a singular entity here, and if you understand that the characteristics are also not inherent to the object. That, of course, well, let me put it to you this way. Now you would understand that it's, an, it's totally delusional to think that this is a black ceramic cup, like inherently. If you, if you think it's a one black ceramic cup, then now from everything we've said, that's not true. That's delusional. You're, you're missing that you're projecting all of that onto this in that way. So if we have this realization of emptiness, if we have this realization of characteristiclessness, but then we see the suchness of there being a cup here. And by suchness, I mean, behold, look. And when I say that, what I, I'm asking you to look, not with your eyes. And what I'm getting at is, is that if you can understand why this appears as a cup, and not be confused that it is a cup, that it is all of those things. If you're not confused that it is those things, but can understand why and from whence it appears to be a cup, then that is seeing, in a sense, suchness. Uh, tathata is uh, thusness or suchness. I sometimes like to translate it as as it isness. So if you were followed me on all of that, that kind of long circuitous route through emptiness, if you followed me on all of that, then there was a way in which we were just cultivating the practice of true suchness. Like if you were following my mental exercise and you were with me on that, and you even got to that point of sort of like, oh, it's not a cup, but it appears to be a cup. And it appears to be a cup because I appear to have lips and I appear to have a hand that could hold it. If you're seeing how all of this appearance is related to each other, and then you're kind of seeing the suchness of things, again, that's the idea of practicing or cultivating the practice of true suchness. But now, can you cultivate the practice of true suchness, yet also without creating the perception of true suchness? So what I kind of often like to point at or remind people of when we get into conversations about suchness, suchness, this teaching of tathata, it's not about like, it's not about that the cup is such. And you'll notice that just linguistically, linguistically, there's a problem there because I've said that the cup is such. But I thought there wasn't any cup. I thought that's what suchness meant, <laughs> is that there isn't a cup. So we have to kind of be mentally careful about the way that we think about this. So I 
kind of alluded to this a moment ago. So it's not about that this cup is such, it's about this whole mental experience that includes the delusion of there being a perceiver there. So the whole kit and caboodle, thinking I'm Michael, thinking I have lips, thinking I have hands, thinking I drink coffee, thinking all of those things, all of that culminates in suchness. So again, to understand the suchness of, say, this cup, you kind of have to understand the suchness of the whole milieu, the whole mise-en-scene, the whole situation here, not just this or that or my hand or something. So the point is, is we're kind of trying to avoid what I would call reification, reification of the cup, reification of my hand, reification of anything. And so that would also go for reifying the very idea of true suchness into a thing, into a, perce a, a perception in that way. Everybody feeling okay about that? Cool stuff. So once again, if there is cultivating the practice of true suchness, yet also without creating the perception of true suchness, and within that profundity, there's nothing being differentiated, that's called explaining the single characteristic Dharma door. Okay. Um, This one from the Tibetan, we have it as Priya Darshana says, the Dharma teaching on the single principle is immersed in suchness. However, it is free from conceptualizations of suchness and does not conceptualize that it is profound. In that way, it teaches the absence of concepts. Hmm. A little bit different there concerning the idea of profundity. The Tibetan translation seems to say that they kind of, I, it's also not profound. That's also I, would be a characteristic of this idea that it's so profound, it's so deep. I, so that's interesting from the Tibetan. All right, shall we do another? Cool, yay. Next up, um, unhindered erudition. How do they translate this? Um, Akshaya Pratibana. Wow, inexhaustible something. Wow, okay, so a little bit different on that. The Chinese and the Tibetans seem to be a little different. So this Bodhisattva, unhindered erudition or intellect in that way, says, if one is able to be completely extinguished of all dharmas and also explains this dharma to others, this is called explaining the single characteristic dharma door. So I will tell you that I, this is where I did start to notice some Mm, I'd call it significant differences between the Tibetan and the Chinese. So let's see. Yeah, so this is this got really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'll read this. It's going to sound very different, though. So the Dharma teaching on the single principle teaches that the inexhaustibility of any phenomena, any Dharma itself is complete exhaustion. This Dharma teaching on the inexhaustible nature of all phenomena does not contravene reality or contradict the Dharma. We've heard that before. So that one's kind of quite different in a way. And I have to tell you, I kind of have my suspicion about why that is. So in the Chinese here, 
it uses a particular um, um, it, it's a little piece of language. It's a little part of a sentence here. And so here in the Chinese, it says that if one is able to comp be completely extinguished of all dharmas and also explains this dharma to others, that's called explaining the single characteristic dharma door. So I noticed that in the Chinese, starting with this one, they start to, um, the poem, the sutra, starts to bring in the idea of, of the bodhisattva explaining this teaching to others. And what gets interesting, and it, it's going on here in our first one here, it's very interesting to start to think about, like, how can I put this? Yeah, let me, let me back up a second. I wanted to make a point, and then we'll kind of approach this again. So this teaching of the, the one characteristic of not having any characteristics, there's a lot of similarity, of course, with the idea of non-duality, right? And I mentioned that the, the famous Dharma door section from Vimalakirti is about non-duality. And there's a, there's a lot of similarity between these ideas. And so the reason why I mentioned that is, is that insofar as, insofar as you can conceive of the single characteristic and non-duality, insofar as you can kind of think of those as the same idea, then the idea of explaining this dharma to others, but trying to think about that in a non-dualistic way becomes very interesting, if you understand what I mean. <laughs> that it, it, it kind of seemingly becomes unavoidably dualistic, unavoidably um, that way. So in the Chinese, they actually start making a point of not only understanding this teaching, but then teaching or explaining this idea to others. And I noticed that the Tibetan doesn't, at least from the English translation, I cannot read the original Tibetan, but from the translation, the Tibetan doesn't seem to be talking about um, teaching other people this. And that kind, of, that kind of goes a little bit with the Tibetan tradition more than the Chinese tradition in that way. The Chinese Bodhisattva tradition is much more socially engaged in that way. It's much more about sharing the teachings, whereas the Tibetan tradition is a little more, everybody's working on it on, the, on their own uh, situation in that sense. But let's go back. This idea of if one is able to be completely extinguished of all dharmas, and that's where the Tibetan was talking about this idea of te <laughs> the Dharma teaching on the single principle teaches that the inexhaustibility of any phenomena itself is complete exhaustion. That, so that sounds different, but it's, it's actually saying the same thing. So the Chinese, as I translated, is this idea of being completely extinguished of all dharmas. The way that you could think of that from the Dharma talk I've been giving tonight is <laughs> being extinguished of all dharmas, by which I mean to say the wisdom that penetrates through all these different seeming phenomena. So a deluded person who's never heard this before is going to be like, Ooh, give me the big cup. I want the big one. And is going to give no second thought to the relativity of the size, 
to the relativity of the use function, the names of all these things, right? A regular mind is just like, give me the big one. The mind that we've been talking about, which understands characteristiclessness and emptiness, that mind is potentially exhausted of dharmas, meaning there's not a dharma to be found. There's not a phenomena to be found. There's no characteristics. All is empty in that way. So if one is able to be completely extinguished of all dharmas and also explains this dharma to others, that's called explaining the single characteristic dharma door. Yeah, Tanya, please. That almost sounds like cessation, like Narodha. Well, that's an important, that's a really important, um, a a really important point to make. Um, Yeah, so Tanya mentions Narodha. So, Nirodha is this idea, term, word that would be translated as cessation. And there's a few different ways to think about that, but I will, I I just want to talk about it in, in two terms. So in the early Buddhist tradition that we talk a lot about, in that early Buddhist tradition, the goal was this idea of nirodha, the cessation. And nirodha is very, very related to nirvana. Nirvana and nirodha are cousins. They're like kind of very, very similar. And the way that I think about that and the, the way that I teach that is you can imagine like, let's say, what, you know, I'm, I'm going to think of a, because of my props that I have here, let's say I'm going to use my record as my prop. So let's say that there was someone who, for one reason or another, let's say that they were a, a well, let's say they were a vinyl record collector, right? So they were very into collecting old uh, 45 records and things like that, right? So let's say that that mind of that person, you know, and, and maybe they were, um, you know, let me, let me really concoct a crazy story here. So like, let's say that this person was displacing, as they say, displacing various forms of anxiety and things into this uh, obsession with collecting records. And you know, the more rare, the better, all of this. And so they're really obsessing about all of this. So now that mind is well you know, conditioned in that way. So then let's say, you know, I have the, the rarest, you know, the rarest 45 known to mankind, right? I don't know, but let's say I do. And it's like in mint condition or whatever. That person whose mind is really, you know, conditioned in that way, if I showed them this, they would get excited. And that would be their vedana. That would be their sensory reaction. Would want it would be one of 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 like excitement and ooh, ooh, and maybe even uh, desire, gimme, gimme, and maybe even craving, like I really need to have that. So all the kleshas, all the the afflictions or the defilements are firing because they're seeing this record. In the old form of Buddhism, in the original form that was more ascetic, more monastic, uh, more kind of about self-discipline, you'd go off to the woods and you'd meditate. And oh, of course, you would give up your record collection. You would renounce. Of course, you would renounce your records. You'd renounce your record player. You'd give up basically music because you're like, you know what? I'm I'm getting too excited 
uh, by the, all of this. And I'm displacing it anyways. I don't even like music, but I'm doing it to, you know, cover up other emotions and things. So let's say you were like, I want to be done with this. I'm going to go join a monastery. You would give up all your records, all your possessions in that way. And then you would meditate and you would calm down and you would work on training your mind. And then maybe, you know, a few months, a few months after joining the monastery, right? You get your begging bowl and you go into the big city begging for food and you, you come across a record store. And it brings up those old feelings that you used to have about collecting records. And so you realize, oh, my mind, my mind is still a little obsessed with, with these records. Back to the monastery. So you go back to the monastery and you do more meditation and you really kind of just get that out of your system until eventually you're able to go into the city and you're able to walk past a record store and you are, you're in control. It's not causing the stirring. And it's just like, and you're, you don't want it anymore. You're, uh, you're over it. You have uh, gotten rid of that and not in any kind of repressive way. I'm not here to bad mouth early Buddhism at all. It's a great path. It works. And it doesn't do it in a repressive way. It does it in a very, like, you, you work on yourself. You work on your own mind in that way until eventually you're like, oh, there's a record, but it's just not doing it for me anymore in that way. I'm, I'm over that. In that little example, the desire for the records and the collecting and the owning of the records, that desire has been put out. And that's called nerodha, cessation. It's gone. It's not arising anymore. Now that's towards records. You might have other desires that are popping up. So you, not, you may not be completely evacuated of all of it. So that's nirvana. Nirvana is when all the afflictions are eradicated. All the bad stuff is eradicated in that way. Okay, so I just walked you through the basics. And the one thing that I want to point out about the early Buddhist path is that when we're done, like when the arhat, who is this person who has achieved nirvana and they're in a state of nirodha or cessation, when that arhat is in that state, and they go into the city, they're, they're, they are seeing, we, uh, the way that we understand it, they're seeing the record store. They're seeing the records. They're seeing all the stuff, but they are in control. And again, that's good because it's not good to be out of control. It's not good to have inanimate objects dictate our mental state. That is not good. So in terms of Buddhism, we're going for control over our reactions in that way so that inanimate objects don't turn us around. But what I want to point out, though, is that, again, in the original path, the record store and the records were still there. The reason why Mahayana Buddhism and the Bodhisattva path is quite different is that it is founded on this teaching of emptiness and characteristiclessness. And so the idea here is, is it would be one thing if you could control that desire for records. It's a whole other thing if you understand that records, that that's an that's empty. That's a concept. That's an idea that it always was a concept or an idea. And so what I'm getting at is, is that when you really tap into and understand this teaching of emptiness and really understand that there aren't these things there in the way that we think they are, all of a sudden, the thing that was 
causing all the desire, that thing is gone. And that's very different than being in the face of the desirable and just being in control of one's desire. It's a whole other thing when you kind of have this eye of wisdom that is understanding, you know, this is really deep phenomenology. This is really deep ontology. This is really deep philosophy. And so, as I often say, the Bodhisattva path, Mahayana, it's a path of wisdom. It's not a path of asceticism. It's not a path of self, like, um, like a kind of stoicism in that way. In fact, what the Mahayana teaches, and it's why I basically teach Mahayana Buddhism, what the Mahayana teaches is that if you understand the, this teaching of emptiness, this teaching of characteristiclessness, if you really understand it, again, there's, there's nothing to be desired. And so the desire is gone because there's a realization that there's nothing there to be desired at all to begin with. And that becomes a kind of, mm, like the way that I think about it is, is it's like if I had a desire for all kinds of things, if I, had, if I was overly uh, sexually desirous, but also wanted to own lots of things, but also was really angry, but also was really whatever, and also was really whatever. There's a way in the early Buddhist tradition where it's like, well, I'm going to have to work on my sexuality, and I'm going to have to work on my possessiveness, and I'm going to have to work on my anger, and I got to work on my this, and I got to work over here on this. But actually, if you, again, if you really penetrate this teaching of emptiness, it, it works on all of those in that way. The thing that I'm angry at is all of a sudden understood to be a concept, an idea. Why am I angry about a concept or an idea, right? Why, so the, uh, again, the idea is, is that through this kind of wisdom tradition, it kind of becomes, um, what's the phrase, like orthogonal, I think is like a way of putting it, like where it cuts through all areas of the problem rather than working on kind of one thing at a time in that way. All right. I think that's gonna be it, unless just, yeah, Tanya. Oh, cuts through, hence the Vajra, right? Ooh, excellent. Love it. <laughs> that is in, indeed the idea uh, of the Vajra and that idea of just the uh, cuts through all the delusion. Yep. Like warm, like a warm knife through butter. <laughs> exactly. Anyways, all set, Michael? I am. That's going to be it. There is, of course, more of this uh, single characteristic Dharma door section to come. So we're going to dive back into this next week. But otherwise, that's going to do it for me. Thanks. Well, I'm, there's some folks that joined a little bit late. So I'm popping back into the chat oh, cool. links to your translation of the sutra, as well as the 84,000 website um, translation from uh, the Tibetan. Um, do you have any announcements, Michael? Um, uh, none right now. Just I'll be back on Sunday night. Uh, opening Dharma doors. <laughs>